Welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Listen in as we discuss all things business, growth and marketing with business owners, thought leaders and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, founder of Roundhouse, the creative agency, Saul Edmonds. Oh, hi, everyone, and welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Penny Hopkinson. How are you going, Penny? Hi. How are you, Saul? Great to be here. Yeah, no, thanks. It's it's really um, fantastic to have you on the podcast. We've got um, a pretty interesting sort of topic today, which I'm sure many people probably haven't explored very much, a really, really interesting niche kind of area, which um, before we get into all of that, um, for people who don't, who don't know you, who don't know what you do, would you be um, so kind as to um, to sort of explain to people what you do, short sort of history of how you got there, and then we'll dive into it from there. Right. Well, I'm a strange beast because <laughs> I write operations manuals for a living, and I specialise in franchising and licensing, um, which is probably – one of the least expected types of um, business you can find. And most people say operations, oh, is it something to do with um, putting bits of furniture together? And (laughs) actually, (laughs) actually, no, it's all about trying to work smarter and harder and replicating a, a business model business system so that if you're running a franchise with a large network, every single member of that network operates to exactly the same um, uh, the same procedures. Mm. So how on earth did I get to do this? Because I was going to ask back- you that, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> my background. How did you, how did you get into this? <laughs> my background is as a journalist. And right. um, I started off in trade and tech. And I think that goes back to when I was about four. Um, I was very interested in how my teddy was growling, what made him growl. <laughs> so I, just, I decided to do, do a sort of growlectomy to see what all this was about. So mm. poor old Teddy got his growl taken out, and I sort of took that apart, put it back again. That's and hilarious. And then showed him all up again. And then I then I graduated onto a musical box, but unfortunately the sum of the parts never managed to get back together again. But I was fascinated in how things worked. My father was an engineer. He used right. to take me to the shop. And, uh, you know, there was this clock that um, had stopped ticking, but he'd take it apart and then it would be all singing, all dancing again. And um, I just thought this was fascinating. So when I was about, um, I suppose, 12, uh, he had his own factory and he used to take me into this um, this place full of hissing, whirring machinery. And he'd say, right, this is, and he'd say, right, this is, does it, now you do it. And the oh, first wow. time he did, it was a hot wire cutter, and it was 600 degrees centigrade. And he showed me how to cut a block of polystyrene. Oh, yeah. Uh, now you do it. So with great satisfaction, I managed to do it. Had my mother known, I think she would have had a fit. Uh, yeah, a twelve-year-old <laughs> naughty, naughty dad. <laughs> exactly, playing with six hundred degrees centigrade. Anyway, um, I was obviously very proud of the fact that um, as I brought the wire down, the other part plopped into a, a, a big box and went off to package something. Mm. So that's how I started my love of you know how things work, mm. and eventually. Um, when I went to college, I did an article. I wrote an article on the art of hot wire cutting, which oh, was. Did you really? Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, <laughs> nothing, nothing really simple for me. Um, 
And I think I always had this thing about wanting to be noticed for what I was writing. And my mm. tutor, um, have you ever thought of getting into technical writing? And at 17, that was my light bulb moment. And that's all I wanted to do. Isn't so, that, is that sort of um, meeting of worlds? Because like you were saying before, like people assume certain things that, that, and they hear the word manual and then you're sort of in journalism and then you have this love of, you know, um, sort of semi um, via your dad with sort of engineering. I mean, that's like a natural fit to me. I, I sort of relate to that very strongly, that meeting of, I guess, sort of creative thinking and creativity and then how stuff works and actually yeah. knowing how stuff works and then being able to, I guess, kind of help other people to do the same when um sometimes when you like that. I mean, I, I, I've sort of thought about this a little bit because I'm doing sort of websites and other things. There's this sort of thing about creativity and building, but then you forget that there's heaps of other people that, um, that aren't really that way minded and actually need like this real sort of help, like having a, manual like you're doing in this kind of sense especially with this that i find really fascinating that um because like you said the idea of having a manual for most people is showing is sort of showing you how to build something or you know it's like you know how to do some practical thing but yours is a little bit different to that so like from what you were saying before then how did you come to be doing this particular part, like specifically um, related to franchising and to um, franchises? Well, after having had various positions in journalism, I ended up by being quality correspondent for two publications in the UK. So I get got to know about total quality management Quality Circles, Kazen, um, everything to do with quality, particularly the introduction of the UK government's white paper on quality, which ended up by being BS, BS 5750, which became the international standard 9001. Right. I was fascinated by it. Um, but at the same time, I was a Middle East correspondent and my work as a Middle East correspondent started to dry up because the area was more political than it was uh, socio-economic, uh, socio-economics and development. Mm. So I thought, well, what can I do that will give me a second career? And right. I realised that there were a lot of people who didn't need to be accredited to BS5750 when the standard was... Um, brought out, um, but they wanted to have their quality systems documented. So mm. I had a marketing initiative and I discovered that there was a whole wide world out there where people did want their uh, standards documented. Mm. And I did a bit of proof of concept and it got me a two-year contract with Lloyds of London, the insurance mm. uh, um, organisation. And I worked for the corporation to produce their underwriting agents' procedures, which mm. was a bit of a baptism of fire because we had the Lloyds Act and we had multiple bylaws, and they all had to be explained in layman's terms. Um, mm. And that that went... Very in, it was really interesting. I loved working in the city. And as a result, that meant that I got my first really major manual under my belt. It was successful and it was uh, the showcase for whatever I was going to do next. Right. The first and hurdle. The first hurdle was met. Mm. Um, and I did quite a lot of work for them afterwards as well. But I was also running my editorships at the same time. And um, 
I was organising the West London Export Group speaker speakers for their meetings in um, the export group met at the Guinness um, factory oh, in right. London. Right. And um, one great day, meetings. <laughs> Oh yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, we had all all the um, the shields from all the um, it was darts and you know all all those kind of sports that they. Oh play in. right, of course, yeah. Had those everywhere. I mean, it's amazing. It was an amazing. Um, oh, that would have been great. That sounds like a fantastic it meeting. It was. It, it was a. It was a wonderful venue, but one of the first people I met was from the Guinness Book of Records. Mm. And they said, ah, Guinness Enterprises has just bought Champneys, which was a, is a very famous spa, probably the first spa of its type. Um, and um, they're looking for somebody to write their manual. Mm. So here I was, willing, ready, willing and able. And I worked with one of the biggest consultancies, and a retail expert, and we did two manuals, one for the spa, one for the club. And I thought franchising was amazing because it did everything I needed in terms of quality management. But the difference between a normal um, business model and franchising is that you have to have an operations manual. Mm. So... And then I got a third one. I joined the British Franchise Association as an affiliate uh, professional advisor, started to work with them on a gold standard for operations manuals, wrote their franchisee and franchisor guides. Then I helped them write the uh, Code of Ethics and the Member's Handbook. Mm. And 2011, I was made a companion of the British Franchise Association. Oh wow, that's I I can't can't imagine <laughs> how much. Well, this is I guess uh, sort of a comment and also a question too about I I sort of can't imagine um, how much knowledge you would have to when you go into writing a new manual for a franchise like having some limited sort of experience from a design point of view with like franchises to do like say brand guidelines for people that Mm. the um, franchisees like have to um or you know should adhere to and having things for them i can't imagine from like the bigger picture of the business and all the different things you'd have to consider like how how much do you um, end up having to know um, outside of the actual technical workings of things about the actual business itself, like the franchise itself, before you start? Or how much do you feel that you sort of have to know to feel comfortable, like at that starting point, like when you're writing, you know, when like you start writing anything, I suppose, let alone a manual before you start for you personally to feel comfortable and to go, yeah, I, I, you know, I sort of have a grip on it. How much do you feel you have to know or is it just this constant work in progress so you find out this or um, how does that actually work for you? It's, two, it's twofold. The first thing is um, that you need to go and see what the franchise is all about. And you Physically. have to see. Mm. Yeah, you have to see a franchise in progress and you go through all the different parts. You get thorough thorough familiarization before you get thorough immersion. Mm. And when I work with some of the very big ones like Costa Coffee um, or Quick Fit, then um, we have teams. So uh, with Costa Coffee, we we had a project manager based in Dubai. And then we had all the departmental or functional heads in London. And we were 
um, writing a manual, not just for the franchisees, but for the um, brand partners who would look for suitable sites and grow the network within their region. Right. It's a very high level. Um, mm. So you're basically talking to uh, people who were within other companies, but they was a, they were a specific team charged with the responsibility of developing a brand in the region. Right. So they still had to be. That was, and I'm am, am I right in assuming part of the reason then for that is so um, even if things don't directly apply to those like um, third parties, that's so everybody's sort of on exactly the same page because um, yeah. there's some flow on effect if they make if they make uh, a decision that on one hand seemingly isn't sort of related and then further down the track there's like someone's like hang on you know this isn't quite right I'm not sure what that I'm I'm, I'm specifically thinking of there but I, I would imagine there's going to be you know it's generally better if everyone's on that same page in the first instance I guess right yeah, it, it is really important because one one of the keys to a successful franchise is that everybody replicates the system in the same way. Mm. So they have to follow the procedures. And generally speaking, um, there are penalties um, if they continue not to follow um, what they're supposed to be doing. Mm. So for example, they get um if for example they fail to um get all the approvals then they'll probably get a warning mm. and then they'll be given a um it, it it will be a breach and cure process um very seldom do you find that franchisees um or brand partners go off the um, beaten track Mm. because they're doing it in the first place to build a business and they know that the the essence of a franchise is to replicate the original successful business model. Yeah, that's the whole idea, right? That's that's the whole whole thing. Is um, This is like something, this is just from my own experience in, you know, simple guidelines that I've I've sort of found and this is probably just like a, a human thing like people wanting to do things for certain reasons but do you do you find that like say in instances where um people have gone I'm like you said they've gone off track for some reason and they've they've gone and done their own thing is it is it either because they're just that way inclined and they don't and they don't pay attention to a manual or in like instances where they didn't have a manual originally um, before you came on the scene or in some like earlier stage of the business, they had one that wasn't well written and didn't outline things. Do you find that sometimes they would go off track just because the information that should have been provided wasn't actually provided well, like and 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 that they then went that it's actually kind of not hundred percent their fault because it wasn't actually outlined, um, you know, that well for them in the first place. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, because there is an art to writing an operations manual. Mm, I bet, yeah. Uh, well, well written procedures are worth their weight in gold. And very often you can't blame the franchisees for not having followed uh, the procedures correctly or they follow the procedures correctly, but the outcome is different because they're not written well. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a subtle point, though, isn't it? That's that's yeah. interesting because it's it wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, if if you've got somebody also looking at the actual real world picture um, because I just know sort of from experience like people who are in a franchise or even like sub parts of a business are just trying to they're 
busy just trying to get things done too. And and they're kind of like racing around and they've got some deadline or they have to do things. And unless it's like really easy for them, for most people, they're just going to go, I oh, don't know. I just have to sort it out myself, you know, and they're just going to do it. Like there's that, you know, thing. So unless there's also an incentive one for it being simple, like you said, like it's, is these other subtle sort of areas of, of it being um, written in such a way, like it might still be written, but written, like you said earlier, in um, you know, layman's terms or terms that people actually get or to do to end up replicating the same thing. Um, so could you actually give me, say, uh, for people listening, if you can think of an example of what you just said, because I find that, really interesting that subtle point of something's written clearly but then the outcome still doesn't end up happening have you got like an example you can think of there penny i think yeah i I think the closest i can say is that um when you're writing procedures you've got to have you've got to visualize Mm. what you're describing and see yourself going through those steps in your mind's eye. Right. A lot of people can't do that. Um, a lot of people see it in terms of um, you tell them, tell people to do something, and then afterwards say that they have got to do something that they should have done before that. Mm. It's rather like saying, um, open up a software program. Oh, and then switch on the computer. Right, yeah. You know, in the early days, we, we actually had to say, switch on your computer. I, ha- I had a conversation today yes. with somebody. Yes. Uh, about this very thing. And, um, she, she was, she was in the States and she was saying, well, you know, I wrote these, um, these little programs. Um, and I had to say, open the software program. And I said, but did you tell them to switch the computer on? Oh, no, she said. I assumed that they would have done that. Mm. Well, so many problems in the early days of computers arose because they hadn't switched the computer on. Yeah, but it sounds, it sounds absurd, but you forget, like it's easy, it's easy in hindsight because we now, like it's just, yeah, it's like walking. Of course you would have, you have to have the computer on, but in yeah. sort of early days, but like even now still, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's just a safe bet not to assume anything, I guess. <laughs> you know, well, I, I think, I think you in Australia have Janet and John books. Do you, right. do you know the Janet and John books? I've, I've heard them, but I don't think I've actually seen them. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very, very, very well known. They're, um, they're basically, um, for children. Mm. And everything is described in very, very simple terms. Mm. And when you're writing procedures, you don't assume that anybody knows anything because somebody who's reading it doesn't know what you're about to tell them. Mm. So, you start in very, very simple, uncomplicated terms and you break everything down in really simple steps using simple language and laying it out in bullet points so it stands out. Mm. Um, and it is, it is a kind of craft. Rather like, you know, writing fiction or writing copywriting, with mm. which you're probably very familiar. Um, brand guidelines, you know, you know about those very well. Um, we have to have brand guidelines because otherwise, if in a network of, let's say, 150 franchisees, um, or in Costa's case, there were over 2000, if they, all did what they wanted with brand guidelines, um, without proper brand guidelines. Yeah. You probably have carrier bags replicating 
um, the logo 15,000 times when that was distinctly something that they did not want you to do. Mm. Yeah, you know. it's interesting. Though I, I remember some years ago now, I think it was like about six or seven years ago, we had a client who had um, a, a franchise and they had a lot of different um, franchisees and they – it was actually as a result of them ironically um reading a blog post that we had on our site about the importance of brand guidelines, like a pretty standard that's important for these reasons, et cetera, et cetera. And they had 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 this like emerging issue that wasn't a big deal in the early days and they've been around for like I think this particular franchise um for some like 20 plus years and they had realized or had sort of observed after reading this article, they'd gone actually like everything's slightly different, like not hugely different, but they had, they never had any guide. Well, they sort of did, did have guidelines, but sort of what we're talking about, like in very um, loose terms, like they just had, There's this and this, but there was no, you should do this or you can't do this. There was none of that. It was like, here's your stuff. But then, and it seemed sort of quite comprehensive. And so we redid the guidelines and brought, there was some, it was interesting because there was some, I think from memory, about six or seven different slight variations that people had sort of mucked around with over the years. And then we're going, okay, this is the definitive one. These are the rules, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, things that have been done millions of times in the past, but it was an interesting example because in that instance, it wasn't wildly different. It was, they were all like subtly different, like slightly different colors and slightly different this, but the importance for the actual franchise, like it's itself had always been there, but they hadn't really realized because it was so subtle. It sort of creeped in very slowly over the years. And it was a great example of sort of what we were talking about before about, um, about when you don't give specific instructions, like really specific and just don't assume that people know that this is important. Uh, they'll just do whatever they want, you know, in, in some form. I I think really the essence of this is that when everything is uniform throughout a franchise, let's say you've got 2,000 franchisees who all look the same and work in the same way, it's very comforting to the uh, customer. Yes. Because they know exactly what they're going to get. Mm. Okay. an example, I was a Middle East correspondent for about 12 years and I used to go throughout the Gulf and there were holiday inns in Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, um, Sharjah and Salala in Oman. Mm. Now, no matter where I was, I mean, I used to do swings throughout the whole of the Gulf states and sometimes I'd wake up and I wouldn't know which where I was but I knew it was Tuesday. Now, Tuesday, I was probably in Abu Dhabi. But because Holiday Inns had um, everything was the same, Mm. there was this comfort in knowing that I was going to experience the same decor, the same uh, type of service, everything. Mm. Um, and it was just there, there, there's just a, a kind of comfort zone mm. whereas if I'd been staying in different um, hotels all the way through through the Gulf it's more unsettling mm. yeah it's it's very true so when when you're writing a manual for I mean a franchise that has um you know some physical location, do you end up covering 
in that manual things like the um, way things are laid out in the store or like or absolutely, absolutely. Mm. merchandising we have um, merchandising plans planograms um, right down to where uh, let's say it's a cost of coffee um, where in a cabinet they're all everything's placed right where on the service counter yeah um, those little plastic um, stirrers or um, serviettes and the um, the condiments and everything um, are set out. It's all done to a plan. Yeah, because you can see, like I, I, I observe this as you know, I can't help it because I'm a designer and I will just see normal things and go, oh, that's interesting. It's like, you know, observe constantly at um, places like Woolworths and, you know, other uh, – of specific big hardware chains, I constantly, like more recently, because I've noticed in more recent years, they've become, um, and pretty sure it's not my imagination that, that they, because I'm pretty observant with things like this, that the stores have become more stringent across all the stores, um, especially in places like Woolworths and certain supermarkets, they, um, the big like hardware chains, more stringent with them. The tool area and the, this area are in the same place. So when you come in the store, because also, especially with, um, a place like Bunnings, which is huge, but they're really big. It's very hard to find your way around. So it becomes like in, in that instance, I mean, I imagine you could probably speak to this then too, like the bigger something is with more aisles and more everything. Um, I would imagine even the importance goes up even more because you go into one over in this suburb and because I go to, I don't know, like I go to a number of them and I've noticed all of them now pretty much are almost identical. You know, if you turn right and go up here, some of them are a bit bigger, some, but they're all pretty and that and that's flows through to what you were saying before. It's comforting, plus it's also just time saving, and that flows through to your level of likely to buy more, maybe. And absolutely, there's nothing that annoys me more than going into <laughs> a well-known uh, supermarket um, in one place and knowing your way around, and then going to another one and <laughs> thinking, what the heck am I? Where on earth is that cereal? And you've, you've got to learn done, it all again. Yeah, well, you've probably done two miles before you actually find your special K or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's really annoying. Um, but it, there, there is some comfort in, in that. And customers really, really like conformity. Yeah, they, I do. I do. I, I, I like it. Yeah, I, I had to, especially like I said before, like you, there's – there's like a lot of aisles. There's a lot of stuff. And I know certain things just through not any specific observation, just through habit. And then you go into another one and go, Oh, thank heavens for that. Like it's just, it actually isn't the same spot pretty much. And you yeah, can really. find it. Yeah. I usually still have to ask anyway, because then sometimes you forget because there's just like so many aisles, but you know, but actually just on a, on a, a point that just occurred to me. What, um, like, say in the manuals themselves, do you, uh, is this something you put in or, and or you do in consultation with the actual business itself as to who are going to be the, the, the person or the people responsible for actually enforcing these things? Cause it's one thing just going, here's your manual and all that. And it's like with brand, guidelines unless you've got someone responsible or you've got a brand guardian or you've got someone in this instance who's going to actually go hey listen like that's not correct you know what's the like who's is okay yeah so tell us about that penny how that works (laughs) so you have your franchise or your franchise in, in in a in a large franchise you'll have a team and they'll probably be the operations director and there'll be a support um, team. And the support team 
will be constantly in touch with a franchisee and they will have to to begin to begin with they'll probably have monthly quarterly meetings um minimum of twice a year and then they will do an audit um they'll have to be every, every franchisee is audited once a year to make sure that brand guide they're on brand um they're doing everything as they should do but um also um have you have you come across the balance scorecard way of uh, doing things it's um, I, I don't it's, think so it's, no yeah it's, it's it's basically like a traffic light system so right. um if you, if you score i don't know 98% um you're in the green zone if you're 96% uh, you're in amber and if you're below that, you're in red. So yeah. the the idea is that um, your franchise it, it'll probably work out like um, um, the eighty twenty principle. So ten percent uh, are doing really really well. You don't have to worry about them. Ten percent um, are doing really badly, and the 80% you're trying to push them up all the time and I suppose even you might um, say that the tenants are doing badly they'll probably fall off the planet in the end because they um they really are not a good fit yeah how long does that usually is is there a um average sort of time frame in those instances where that actually happens where you personally have seen that ends up happening, whether that's going to work out or not as like a year, two years, like where um, with those those um, groups of people, it'll, it uh, just won't um, sort of work out? I, I would say that by the third year, it's absolutely apparent that right. it's going to be a good fit. Hmm. And they probably signed up um, – the franchises are variously sort of five years and ten years. Mm. Uh, so uh, either the franchisee realizes that it's it, it's just not going to work, or if they're sort of limping along, um, they're monitored very closely to see whether um, there is anything that is going to put them in breach, and if they're in breach of the contract. Um, the franchise agreement um, to the extent that it's apparent that they're not going to do what they should be doing and what they signed up to do, they may well be asked to um, uh, terminate the contract. Mm. What the, that's obviously to a very large extent that is actually up to the um, the franchise to actually like their level of and willingness to sort of, you know, enforce things, um, things too, right? Like have, have you like as, as to, um, cause some people, cause ultimately it comes down to individuals, like individuals going like I'm more comfortable with doing this than other people are. Like have you found that that's a, a factor to some extent, like that human factor? Of. Yes, but what I would say is that a lot boils down to defining who your ideal franchisee is. Sure, what specifics. Yeah. 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 And is what we generally say is define like your customer avatar because your franchisee is your internal customer. Mm. So you define precisely what uh, traits, characteristics, skills, whatever you want from the person who's going to be your ideal franchisee and stick to it. It's mm. not a recipe for, um, you know, just getting loads and loads of franchisees on board yeah. because you think that you're going to get all the franchise fees and all the initial costs and so on, um, you have to be absolutely certain of the kind of person you want as your franchisee. 
you can have the traits and characteristics and train in the skills because a lot of franchisees are un, um, unqualified in terms of the um, the kind of franchise they join, but that can be trained mm. without values, without um, aligning those values. You are likely to become unstuck. So mm. time and time again, we hear, oh, we recruited so and so. Well, I don't know. We just we just needed to fill um, that particular um, franchise territory, mm. and they had the money, so we signed them up. Mm. Not good enough. Right? Yeah. Well, it's it's ultimately, um, yeah. I mean, you might not realize that at the time, but I guess that comes back to being very specific again. Right. It is. Like. And the other thing is you don't want somebody like yourself because <laughs> you, don't, you don't want an entrepreneur. Sure. You don't want, you right. don't want who's going to go against the whole philosophy of a franchisee who is somebody who wants to run their own business, mm. but they don't do it alone they want something that is a successful business established established and they can follow it and have all the support they need to make it a success and the manual is part of this and this is one of the reasons that i wrote wrote the book because um apart from the fact that very few people write operations manuals Mm. and i still something like 35 years of working in the franchise industry and um, creating operations manuals um, into into a book for uh, anybody in the future. I wanted to um, demonstrate that with a really good operations manual, you can help your franchisees succeed. Mm. I think it's, it's, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really like super interesting because the more you talk about, the more I'm sort of thinking about like the, the multi-purpose sort of uses for it too. Cause I, I hadn't, hadn't really considered because when, when we were first talking and, and you were, um, introduced to me and I was looking up, I mean, what you're doing in general to what, um, it was, it was all about. I was sort of thinking, um, obviously about, um, like the franchisees and that they need these things. And then, um, some of those other things I hadn't considered, um, we've been talking about, but then I hadn't been thinking so much about the actual, like the importance for the, um, the franchise or, um, themselves about how much they then need to consider like you were saying like their avatar for who that is so like in 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 your book too um do you actually out outline those things i imagine like those yes well what what i what i do is i draw distinctions between um franchisees for different sectors um for example have the same franchi- type of franchisee uh, for a children's ent- infotainment franchise as you would for, um, let's say, a retail out- outlet or um, one of the services like um, um, drain clearance and that kind of thing. Mm. You know, you, you 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 need different skills, different. Um, mentality um you know we we, we all um if you take a cross section of us um your friends your business acquaintances they're all doing something slightly different Mm. and therefore you need to match people very very closely to what you think that they're going to be good at Mm. um you can't set somebody up to fail 
I can sort of see with how how you're talking about it. I can see with your journalistic background. I can see like this sort of interest in people too, like this this kind of this um like this sort of uh interesting to me that you came from that and having like you know not doing journalism myself, but always assuming like that somebody generally who's you know some sort of correspondent and you're reporting on stories like there's always um i I've always generally imagined there would need to be like a real interest in just people and stories themselves, but then you've got this um apparent mix of that and then like how stuff works. There's just like how do you <laughs> you know how do you kind of almost like um almost like um reverse engineering the story you yes. know as yeah it's like you take the it's like the you told the story i guess a bit like you were saying before you have to sort of run through it in your mind as if you're doing it as your story so like you've got the story and it's like you know Ansel and Greta or whatever you know or, or some story and then you, you got to break it apart and then go okay so if i'm going to then get somebody else to read this story in exactly the same way that i just read it how do i how do i get them to do that i mean that seems really that seems like a really tricky thing to me on the face of it i'm sure most people would probably make the assumption that well you know you just have to break it down but some of the things you were saying before there's all these these extra little subtleties it's not as as straightforward as that um you have to no, no, what, what what i basically do is go into a company and deconstruct it yeah and yeah. Put it back together again um and where, where you've got a team, each team, um, there, there, there's a very specific process. It's a three-step process. The first is always to develop a structure for your operations manual. So um, I have a formula for that, which has been perfected with my clients over the years. And we break the manual down into people marketing and promotion, day-to-day -day operations and development, growth and profit with an introduction at the beginning. Mm. And we take all the IP, the intellectual property, and we um, start to build up a picture of what is going to go under those main categories. Mm. So what we've got and what we need and then once we've got a structure that is the blueprint of the company or the franchise, mm. Mm. we then start to populate that with the experts. So you've got and your hierarchy, all, all sort of structure, you've got your hierarchy tree, and then you yeah. start to fill it in with yeah. content. Yeah, yeah. So so it's like a giant, I, I always describe it as a giant jigsaw, you know, the mm. ones that we did as kids, the thousand the thousand piece jigsaw that I used to do with my father at Christmas. And we used to get all the blue sky together, the little thatch together, the garden, uh, the grass together, the wall and all the rest of it. So we put all our pieces in particular um, little piles and then we'd start to do all the edges um, yep. of the jigsaw and then start to build it all into the centre. Mm. And that, to me, is how um, the operations manual is developed. Mm. But with the experts providing the content under very uh, clear guidelines, because writing a standard operating procedure is not that easy. Um, you know, you've got people um, who are heads of um, um, their departments they write reports, but it's nothing like writing a standard operating procedure um, and being able to visualize all the steps needed to complete a process. Mm. So I guide them through that. And then at the end, I will edit the entire manual. 
which mm. is what I, I suppose um, is my superpower because <laughs> I love it. I really love it. I can see that. Yeah, but it's <laughs> it. Yeah, it has a very it has a um like in in my own way I suppose it has a very strong appeal to me because I love um like I like not that I'm especially good at it but like I really like finding out how stuff works generally in fact I've had like a my one well one of a couple of things that I watch online at the moment specifically that I'm kind of really obsessed with at the moment is just finding out how random stuff works like how they um one recent one which was like how they mine marble on the process they go through to actually mine marble and what they have to do and like the machines they use it's like that's incredible or like how these guys you know make the how they saw another one recently was how these craftsmen in thailand made the big giant bells and the temples how they do all oh. that and I was like that all that stuff i mean just from artistically and and just just the process they go through i find that really fascinating i'm not sure exactly why i think it's just understanding that thing we were talking about before that mix of creativity and engineering is like a very compelling thing because and then especially in your instance too like because you're in a way creating a manual about manuals really are you like that's sort of like in in a sense like manual magic is like a a manual about manuals but it's pretty meta it yeah i mean it, it it was such a, a strange process because <laughs> i find it really easy to work with clients but you try and get it out of your own head oh yes yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. and you know, I sat down from January um, last year and did 12 hour days until I got my manuscript. But I wasn't happy to have, you know, you do this, you do that. I have done this. What I did was to wrap it into stories and case studies. Right. And I also have a fictional franchise called Patisserie Penelope. Penelope is my real <laughs> real name and, um this is a a, a lovely fi fictional high class dream business is that your dream business penny well that, that <laughs> actually that 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 was the one it seems to have figured a lot in my life yes maybe there's something in that well yes. my mother was a, was a wonderful cook and when i came mm. home from school she would have at the end of the week she would always have all sorts of things in the kitchen, like chocolate eclairs, coffee eclairs, a oh, piping wow. full of creme patissière. And um, then she'd make um, Cornish pasties. And I mean, she used to make wonderful, wonderful things. Mm. She, she was great. And then when I was at college in Hampstead, one of the most entrancing places was a patisserie called Louis. Mm. And everybody talks about Louis today. It's been going, I don't know how many years. And I got all my cakes for my 21st birthday party um, from Louis. Mm. And then when I lived in London, downstairs um, from where I lived, um, a patisserie suddenly started up, and that's when I met my. It's recurring. My it's recurring in your never, life over and over again. And I never, and I never realised it until I sat down to create a fictional franchise, and that incidentally was where I met my great friend Jane, who lives in Brisbane. Right, right. So, so at the end of the day, I got I got to know um, uh, Vera and Leon. Uh, Leon very very well indeed it was Maison Verlon and at the end of the day particularly on a Saturday I go back up to my sixth floor flat armed with boxes of patisserie no wonder I'm you know I, I, sh I should be about 20 stone you'll but, uh, feel for the coming writing <laughs> <laughs> fuel so, fuel for your creativity 
<laughs> of course. And, um, and, and, and so um, Patisserie Penelope was born, and it's an entire chapter, 8,000 words, of how this patisserie was built, developed alongside the manual, and wow. how they used the manual. Now, in today, today, 30% of the global workforce are young millennials or Generation Z. They don't respond to a lot of text. They're the YouTubers, TikTok and Instagram generation. Mm. So we have to approach how we write our manuals differently today. Mm. So in my book, apart from talking about the text part, anything that you can visualize as a procedure, you should think in terms of doing a video. Mm. First of all, all generations can take in and learn better from video, mm. but even better if your colleagues are, are preparing the video. Yes. So we have a scenario. They're learning where, at the same time. Yes. So we have a scenario where Mary, in the, this fictional patisserie, um, has noticed that there's a problem with butter softening. Mm. So the kitchen hand, when he arrives or she arrives, is supposed to take the butter out of the fridge so it's soft enough for the chef to bake the Victoria sponges. However, very often he forgets. So Mary thinks up a way of getting the butter to the right consistency quickly by putting it in the microwave, timing it on. So we have 30 steps in this video. This is then put on a special platform, a knowledge sharing platform, mm. because today I forget about the traditional operations manual and I reposition it, rebrand it as a knowledge sharing environment mm. where we can learn and grow. Who wants to follow an operations manual? If Reach you're the whole thing. Yeah, not going to happen probably. No, not going to happen. Switch off immediately. Yeah. So Mary goes to her manager and says, I've worked this out. Can I produce a little video on my cell phone with, um, I can't remember what his name was, um, with the kitchen hand? No faces. We just show hands. And then we'll get it ready. And if you like it, we can put it on the um, knowledge sharing platform. So she does this. She gives it to her manager. The manager sends it off to head office who love it. It's sent on the platform so that everybody in the network can see it. Further, it's output in a QR code so that Let's say we're talking about um, stripping down a coffee machine. Mm. You put the QR co uh, code on the coffee machine so that anyone. Easily scannable. Capture it. Yeah, capture the QR code. See the steps involved with captions or even a voiceover in any language using AI. So mm. you don't even have to translate it. And the job is done just as you had intended it. Mm. It's very good. Yeah, that actually answers a another question I was going to ask, which was about how 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 is actually delivered in terms of like actual written book, digital version. But I, I didn't actually, I hadn't actually, um, uh, hadn't actually thought about what you're saying with the knowledge sharing uh, platform, but that's 
and that's like a natural um, fit. Obviously, that's you know, I mean, that's they're widely used. They're well, good ones are you know, in um, because like there's just yeah, I mean, I I hundred percent um agree. Certainly, video is you know that's the safe bet. You know, that's like the lowest sort of point of absorption in terms of people looking and listening and having it like, you know, to the point for a specific task. Yeah, um, re- research shows that video is the best way to absorb information like that. Mm. Uh, it, it, it is fantastic. And when when your peers are producing those videos mm. on, on a mobile, on a cell phone, um, and you get that level of engagement and the head office says, right, um, for anyone who, who has produced a how to video for the knowledge sharing platform, they immediately get a gift card mm. at the end of the year when we have our annual conference. The best one will get a prize. Mm. So you begin to um, get this kind of engagement. And um, I use the um, analogy of the patisserie and baking all the way through the book. Mm. I think that's a so, great idea. Like having that, you that's, that's, that's yeah, obviously the best way to do it is to invent you know, something that you can completely break apart that then you know uh, that um, I can't remember who said this, but it's like something like um, uh, I can't remember the first bit, but it's about story sell, you know, to weave anything into a story automatically makes it relatable, you know, yeah. to, to, to people, even if they don't specifically relate to the actual details of the story. Because it's a story, the you know we're kind of hardwired to listen more straight away, you know, because you're, there's characters and there's a beginning and an end and there's like a narrative and you're sort of engaged to that and you're you know I don't know like the ins and outs of you know medically or scientifically and whatever, but but it's always interesting to me too that you know any. Any time, like anything that I, um, you know, like all the other things is, is like that. And that's, it's the case with everyone, but, you know, weaving anything into some sort of story is, is, yeah, uh, I, super good. I, I, I just didn't want this to be another book about a business topic. I wanted it yeah. to be more engaging. And the mm. other thing that done with it i've got my own qr code there um which uh if you scan it it goes into my database so that it gives people who read the book somewhere to go to learn a bit more and use the examples that i've got in the database um i wanted it to be something different something um relatable um something that you can actually use from start to finish and end up with your manual i think that's key isn't it because like there's so many um like i mean it's the it's the bane of probably most brand guidelines too i i would wager that most brand guidelines um you know, don't like un, un, unless there's this other practical aspect, like either something like a easy central place where they can go to to get things or like useful things. So everybody knows all the time of like how, where, and what to do because like the assumption that just because you give something useful, like i.e. like a manual or guidelines or some helpful document that someone's going to actually read it and use it is is kind of wrong like 
yeah, obviously some people will, but like there's these extra things I've, um, that we've been talking about, you know, just one, the willingness to the level of engagement, three, like, you know, the accounting for different sorts of people, like you're talking about with, you know, um, different generations, different learning styles, like all, all these, all these factors that you sort of thought through. I think it's really, um, really great, Penny, because it, it's, um, uh, it sounds like too, actually, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but like everything you've been talking about, even though it's sort of more specifically relating to franchises, it sounds like it's a lot of information that would be just incredibly useful for, or, you know, small business or just, you know, it, it sounds it, like it, it would be. It, it, it is. Um, there are a, a surprising number of businesses have never written down a procedure hmm. yet. When, let's say, a key person goes off sick, everybody's running around wondering how to do this, that, or the other. Yeah. If it's in the manual, in some shape or form, yeah. then you take that out. Um, manuals are not just for franchises. The concept of the franchise manual is terrific. It can be applied to any business. All businesses depend on people. To get sales, they depend on marketing and promotion. In order to operate, they've got to operate day by day to general rules, whether it's a computer system, whether it's financial systems, uh, whether it's a membership program, they've got to um, operate some kind of general system. And then they've got to develop and grow. Without mm. that, they're stagnant and nobody's going to make any more money. Yeah, the knowledge so, is just held within certain people. Yeah. Yes. So it's a case of getting that knowledge out of your head onto the computer um, or onto a cell, uh, a mobile phone mm. and having a series of short how-to videos. It would make so much sense, so much difference. Yeah, and they're pretty quick. Like that's the so funny. I've I've actually um is sort of interesting because I've in recent times I've actually been in in the habit of even some um like it's sort of loosely related to what we're talking about, but I've been in the habit of instead of writing an email to somebody where they, cause I, I have things that I have to do or we have to do in general in the business where someone goes, Oh, can you show me how to do this? Or, or, or they've had their training for how to edit a website or do something. And then invariably what always happens is that they don't need to do it. Then a year later, they're like, Oh, I have to do it. I completely forget how to do it, you know, and, and, um, so I'm, I'm in the habit these days of, just um you know one of many tools that are out there where you can just do a screen video. So I just do it's it's really quick. It's like way quicker, like infinitely quicker than um me having to write or having to take separate sort of screenshots and then explain it in an email. I just do a video, I just go bang, I log in, I say, hey, how you going? This is the this is what you do. And I always actually Actually, you know, remind myself to go log in here, you know, log in, you know, don't forget, like we were saying before about switch your computer on. I always, cause sometimes I've, I've, I've forgotten that and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, people are like, how do I log in? Oh, sorry. You know, so do that and then just go, da, 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 da. might be a minute or two, sometimes a bit longer. Very quick for me to do. Very, um, because it's a very, Natural thing because I know how to do it. And it's harder, it takes longer than to break it down. But I show it, then it shows 
more clearly how where I've gone because it's all in motion. But like that's just another real world example for me that I found and I never used to do that that much for some reason. I don't know why. I I, I just I just didn't, but it just occurred to me that this is way quicker. Or even sometimes I reply email. I've actually just done um, because I use it all the time now, and I'm com- I think that that idea um, of being, which we sort of touched on before, about being comfortable with tools that that's flowed through to me. But like, um, that I think that's like a really sort of underrated thing. Like we were talking about the different, you know, there's uh, a sharing platform, you know, for the information if it's on their mobile. Like things that people are comfortable with, then they're going to be more likely to use, really, aren't they? As well, which are and more engaged, as well, of course. Yes, I mean, I'm I'm of the generation that likes to read text, but what do I do if I want to? I don't know. Change the bulb in the oven. I go to YouTube. Yeah. Simple. Um, and um. I mean, there there are dozens of examples of people of any age group going to YouTube to find out how to do something. Mm. The the difference with YouTube is that unless you've got the professional who is um, explaining how to do something, you can find yourself... um, going on the wrong track and this is why in a franchise or any any business if somebody is going to produce that um that cell phone mobile video with 30 different steps Mm. then they should do a brief storyboard it needs to be authenticated by head office mm. and then they know that it's correct. Yeah. So they still, it's not just like, Hey, they can do what they like. No, yeah. it's still, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that just all, it all, all these roads then sort of lead back to the central point of truth really, doesn't it? Like there's, it is the central there's point of truth. Point. Yeah. 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 So, absolutely. um, so tell us just a, a little bit about how you came to, um, came to create Manual Writers International. Cause that's your, that's your thing, isn't it? That you created? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this, this was really going back to BS5750 and deciding that, um, there was a better way of helping people who didn't want to be um, or didn't need to be accredited to the um, the British standard. So thinking about um, how I was going to go about it, because it, it, it was quite a leap from being a journalist. OK, I was explaining things, um, but... Um, not in quite the same way that you would mm. do, uh, for a manual. I mean, a manual is, you know, something like a hundred times an article. You know, mm. you, you're talk, talking about an average, um, I mean, my book is 50,000 words. Mm. And the average manual is somewhere around there for, mm. for, for um for for an organization that's got a big network but sounds like multi- a big job for somebody really isn't it like say it for is. yeah i mean you can multiply the difficulty of it i mean you know exactly what you're doing and you're writing this manual for manuals like to to help people and then there's like somebody there are many people who really don't like writing at all um, who don't feel they're very good at it. They're, I, well, actually, I, I know plenty of people like who have been clients who, who say that, but in reality, they're okay. 
um, they just, you know, it's, it's like anything. Like sometimes you just have a really unfounded fear of something you don't feel you're very good at, but oh, yeah. like you're actually all right at it. Like yeah, certainly not the case at all. You just, it's just a matter, I think from my point of view of feeling more comfortable and just doing it. Like the, I'm just getting over the initial thing and going, actually, it's not as scary as I thought. But like obviously having something that you've you're like stepping people through in this different sort of story driven way, I find really interesting. There's, there's, there's another way for people who are um, scared of that blank piece of paper. Where do I start? <laughs> yeah, that's right, the blank piece of paper. And you know, we 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 are blessed um that we're we're living in this particular era i know uh, ai is often maligned um for those who use it ethically and responsibly then it can be a great tool if you know how to prompt it mm. and that's thing that i have in my database um so if if you, if you want to start um deciding what should go under people in your operations manual. Ask mm. Chat GPT, ask Claude, mm. and give it context so that it can give some intelligent I- ideas. Mm. Use those ideas constructively from your knowledge and see what makes sense what you can add to it, but it is a great starting point for somebody who mm. um, is a little bit shy of knowing where to start. Mm. I agree. I, I 100% agree. I think it's like a lot of tools. The tools really aren't sort of a thing in themselves. There's something to help you like more or less like you might be have more expertise in area and you need to use the tool less in a particular way and some people need to use it more and still and and, until they feel more comfortable um because yeah i mean i i I 100 agree i think heaps of people would find that they're like i don't have any ideas i mean it's just that starting it's like i don't have any ideas but that's probably just because in many instances, they're just not used to generating ideas. And it's just like a matter of like, I've, I've got a pretty, um, I feel like I do anyway, like I have a pretty workmanlike approach to creativity. Cause I think creativity or creative thinking, I don't really buy the whole, um, uh, whilst I sort of accept that some people are more predisposed to being creative or whatever I mean, you want to say, but a lot of it is just hard work and repetitive tasks and having the willingness to do that and get through like the first hundred or like a thousand times you do it isn't something that most people are going to want to do because they have a different idea about what being creative or generating ideas sort of is that it just sort of like comes to you in a moment. I mean, that's kind of true. Like you do have moments of sort of, of uh, going, yeah, that's a great idea. But then ultimately there's just like, especially if you're writing then too, there's just, I mean, it's kind of time consuming. You just got to, yeah. <laughs> it's got to I mean, be there doing it. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're lucky. You and I are lucky um, because we are creative people and we know what it takes to to visualize something and then um get it down um on in paper mm. um paper but there are so many people who um for many reasons either they find it difficult to write but more than ever they are worried about being judged oh yes true that's yeah that's that's the elephant in the room isn't it yeah it's it's that's it's really true it's um yeah no i think you've actually hit hit the nail on the head i think that's more it because like i i mean i i, I can think of 
heaps of people have have these conversations with clients and people going, oh, you're the creative one. I'm I'm not. You know, I'm not a creative person. It's almost like a badge that people wear. And I actually have said to people, I go, I don't, I don't really believe that, especially when I hear people talking and people have like really good ideas and they're, and they're like, what you've just been saying is like pretty good and pretty interesting. So I don't really buy that you're not creative. Like that's just doesn't add up for me. And they're like, Oh no, I'm not creative. I go, well, I beg to differ. Like I actually think you, you are. And here's why is because being a creative and creative thinking, I think are two things that are kind of mixed up and people, people put those things into the same pot. And I don't think they're really the same thing. Like there, there's an ideal of like you're being creative and you have like sort of um, whatever, like an inspiration from a muse or something. And you have this idea come to you in the middle of the night and you're like, whoa. And then you've got it all mapped out in your head and it just comes out. And I mean, there's moments certainly where there's a flow, but ultimately the creative thinking is all this problem solving. Like there's all, there's like hundreds of thousands of things that are like, okay, then I go down this end, down this path. And, you know, it's often a problem for me because I have to put myself back on a certain train of thought. I'm like, just calm down and just. Go down that rabbit hole. Oh God, um, it's it's terrible. It's a terrible problem sometimes. I gotta like rein myself in because I'll be like, "Wow, that's really interesting," and I'll go down this path and then go, "What was I talking about?" And I have to go back. But I mean, it's good when certain tasks are on, but still, that willingness to, I guess. In some way, like the willingness to do something and the fear of failure, they're linked. Yep, those they two, are. those two things. It's like diving in and just seeing how it goes. I mean, and being okay with making heaps of mistakes is really important. I think, you know, and then I you get better and then you get better. But if you'd never it's do it, that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the only way to learn is through your mistakes. Mm. I mean, when, when I started out writing manuals, I hadn't got a clue what I was doing. Yeah. I put I put huge publications together um, when I was editor of Media International, the European Journal for Planners of International Advertising. Um, this was a 48-page tabloid published every six weeks. And it was huge. It was dealing with um, the biggest advertising agencies in the world, the biggest publishers, the smallest publishers and anything in between. And we um, I was responsible for all the editorial and laying out the magazine. Um, And I thought that if I could do that, I could surely do a manual. Mm. Um, same principle, but it actually takes an awful lot longer. I mean, the, the contract for the underwriting agents procedures at Lloyd's was a two year contract. Mm. Um, and it just got done, uh, two volumes within that time. Um, principally because of multiple bylaws on which, um, the whole of the Lloyd's, uh, business turns, mm. uh, were, were being constantly updated. And then you had the problem that um, you'd um, you'd finish something and then the lawyers had to to look at it and they would try to put it back into legalese. No, no, stop. That's not what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People, people. And and you can understand that, too. It's like the difference between um maybe like the architects and engineers of the world versus someone who's making a painting is I'm um, especially with a lot of um engineers like some of who are friends and clients they're they're like really good they're this sort of level of amazing detail that they have to know but then they're usually not very good at like explaining any of that to a normal person 
but they're it's it's quite hard because they're using a certain language that they're required to do their job, but then they don't ever also ever usually often have any need to you know explain because they're usually talking to other engineers or like other yeah. architects, and so they don't have any need to like do what you're doing. And so they don't. And I mean, that makes complete sense. Like I I wouldn't expect um, like anyone to understand certain things about what I talk about to like other people in our industry that we're like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, you know what everyone's talking about. And other people are like, that sounds like crazy. That's like crazy talk, you know. (laughs) a a A lot of what happens when you're talking to somebody in the same business is that you don't actually um, need to explain. The other person knows exactly what you're talking about. Yes, the unspoken things, yeah. Yeah, it's it's sometimes not what's spoken, it's the unspoken. Yeah, good point. Yeah, no, that's that's really, that's true. And see, that's probably why you're um, you're obviously very good at this because there's these little other human kind of elements that you're taking into consideration about when you're you've you know written this that uh it's not just you know start here and finish here explain all the stuff really clearly and then expect people to just read it like these other human elements that you've thought through I think is is um really interesting, Penny. And um I'm so how long has the book been out for now? Since October. Since October. Right. I'll say pretty recently. So it's still new. Still new. Um, wow, we, that's so exciting. And I have nineteen five star reviews. Oh, very I'm good. Thrilled, I'm absolutely thrilled about. Um yeah. I shall I shall kill the one who's who's done a four four <laughs> star if I find out who they are. <laughs> exactly. Well, no. at least you might you might find that which I've found too is like some people just kind of aren't aware that that's um to some people like an insult. They go, Well, it's still like four stars, that's pretty good. Like I've I mean heaps of people like that, they're like how come you're upset? Yeah, you know, like it's still like pretty good because I didn't think because a five for me is this, and you go, oh look, you know, it's like, <laughs> but and, and there are people who just will not give five stars. You know, I, I, um, run, I, run, I ran a holiday let. For, that's on principle. Ten, yeah, I, I ran a holiday let for ten years, and um, no matter what. If you got you got four star reviews saying that everything was fabulous. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, but that's an example again of then, you know, we make you make assumptions like we've got an idea that it should be this, and someone else is like, "What's the problem with that?" But that should be normal. There's these other um human sort of things. So, um, but as as we're I guess sort of. Uh, getting towards the end of um, what we've been talking about, I'll, I'll just also ask you to, Penny, I should have actually, um, I forgot to say this to you earlier, but at the end of, so my bad, sorry, but um, at, <laughs> at the end, so I'm going to put you on the spot because I usually say at the start to people, I usually go, hey, Penny, like at the end of the podcast, like I'll be, um saying to you, hey, can you give us like some sort of like quote? It can be, you know, something you like or, you know, or direct from you that relates or that you just like, you know. So, Penny, have you got a quote that you would like to tell everyone or that you'd like? Yes, I have. It's, um, let me, let me get... Thing. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it's, it's a favourite quote from Aristotle. Oh, yes. Uh, I have to try and find it. 
to, to I would not want to misquote him. No, I wouldn't want to do that. So bear with me a second. And I will tell you. So, right. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Yeah, that's what that's what we were talking about before, isn't it? That's interesting. And yeah, that's it's really so, true. That's what I've quoted in my book. It's what I quote on my website. Um, because basically, the more times you repeat something, it becomes second nature. Yeah. And then, and then I think, yeah, I mean, just as a side thought to that, I've, I've always then thought too, it's like once you reach whatever that point is where you've done it, you know, um, X amount of times, then you feel comfortable enough. And then for like a lot of people, that's, it almost gives you the freedom to be more creative because you don't have to wade through all this other stuff. Yeah. If, um, I think a, a really good example is when you created a web, somebody's created a website for you. Mm. And you have to learn to keep it up to date. Mm. Now, the first time you go in, you worry to death. That you're going to destroy you- it. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> Believe me, I've been there. I know all about uh, that. And um, then the next time you go in, you think, hey, yeah, okay, I managed to do that, so that's fine. And if you keep going back in and learning a bit more, a bit more, and a bit more, you then become comfortable. You know how something, you know the cause, you know the effect, Mm. and you know that if you do something that is not what you would have wanted, how to get out of it. Yeah. A little, a little, a little uh, pro tip that I always say to people when I'm, um, when I show them how to use their website is one of the first things I say, after I gauge like their level of comfort with it, as I say, just create a new page that's not actually live on the website. Do whatever you like to it. Like, do, you know, add whatever you like, do whatever you like, edit whatever you like, you know, then anything you do, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it looks terrible. It doesn't matter. Like, um, and then if you want to revert to that page, even if it's, a copy of like another page that's not live, just play around with it and get like a level of comfort and use that like as your way to get through that anxiety because then there's no real consequences. And then people are like, oh, that sounds pretty good, you know. Yeah, which which is what happened when I redid my um, manual writer's website um, because I'd never dealt with Divi before. Yeah. I've always, I've always hated WordPress. Uh, yeah. um, so I just needed to tr- try and destroy a page that wasn't going to be seen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a great way to do it. And then, and then after a certain point, you feel comfortable. That's like, I mean, what we were saying before. But um, yeah, I mean, have you got? Um, we've covered like a fair bit of. Um, Grant, have you got like anything else um, more specific that you'd like to add, Penny, like from um, in relation to the book or um, sort of other things that you'd like to get out there or like to um, to tell people of, um, before we wrap up? I, th- I, th- I think if anybody is really interested in developing their own operations manual hmm. and once a tool that will guide them through it. Go and find Manual Magic on Amazon. It's available oh. in Australia. It's available anywhere in the world. I'm going to be looking at it. I can tell you right now. 
yeah, I'll, 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 I'll be, um, yeah, I think it's, it sounds like, um, and for people listening too, I think, like we were saying before, I think it's actually would be hugely beneficial even if you don't have a franchise. Like if you just got all the, all the small business owners out there, I think it would be uh, crazy helpful. Yeah. You, you don't need to do it all at once. Just build it up like the proverbial jigsaw. Yeah. And the satisfaction, if you do one main process a month, the satisfaction at the end of the year and the usefulness you will find, I mean, it will help you scale your business because you will be revising that manual or those processes, even if you're capturing it with a cell phone. Mm. Just do things that you know will be really valuable. Your brand guidelines, first and foremost, I I think, Mm. um, those are really important. Mm. How you recruit your recruitment process Without good people, your business will suffer. Mm. Without good marketing and promotion. Do those things that are probably the softer side than the day-to-day operations. Then once you're comfortable with those, go into your financial processes and everything you do every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year. Mm. And just down like that. Follow the pattern that I've set in the in the book. But above all, enjoy reading it because in addition to how to put a manual together, there is a measure of entertainment in it. Mm. That's great, Penny. I think that's a a fantastic um, sort of way to finish the podcast. And what's the best is last thing. What, what's the best um, location or locations online for people to find out more about you outside of just um, searching on, because it's on Amazon, right? Yes. The book's on Amazon. If you, if, if you look for manual magic and my name, um, you, you'll find it in, um the region that you um you subscribe to Amazon. Yeah. Uh it's in Kindle and paperback. Um paperback is I, I tend to think that a paperback is easier to read. Mm. Um but um for those that like Kindle, Kindle's available and in six months time there'll be an audio. Yeah. Um Oh, audiobook. Oh, good one. I, okay. I, I hope I'm, I'm not going to be narrating it, but um, it seems as if I might <laughs> look like find find something to clone my voice. Now that I'm, would be a good. Yeah, AI I'm, a, I'm a big uh, audiobook fan. Yeah, I've been listening to a lot, so that would be great. But yeah. um, um, have you got have you got a website you'd like people to? Yes, I've at? got um. It's the the Manual um, Writers International website, which the the easy way to get to it is manualmagic.club. Mm. Okay. Manualmagic.club. Fantastic. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Thanks, Penny. Thank you. Thank you so much for going through all that with me. It's been extremely interesting, and I really hope that – um, that people listening, um, have a look at. I'll, I'll, I'm going to certainly be, um, looking at it and, um, I look forward to the audiobook too. That would be, that would be great. Um, so with that in mind, that's actually it for today, everyone. Thanks so much for listening, um, yet again to our podcast. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Say goodbye, Penny. Goodbye, everybody. Saul, thank you for a wonderful opportunity. And, well, keep writing those processes. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) See ya.
Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Grow Your Business. Have a great day and we'll see you next time here at the Grow Your Business podcast.